Welcome, everyone. Dr. Michael Clapper is a graduate of the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Chicago and has practiced acute, medical care, acute care medicine in Hawaii, Canada, California, Florida, and New Zealand. To improve the health of his patients as well as his own and to minimize suffering of sentient beings, Dr. Clapper adopted a plant-based diet in 1981. A longtime radio host and a pilot, Dr. Clapper has served as nutrition advisor to NASA's programs for the space colonists on the moon and Mars and on the nutrition task force of the American Medical Students Association. He has authored numerous articles on plant-based nutrition and is authoring a book on using plant-based medicine to arrest and reverse disease. Dr. Clapper has practiced nutritionally based medicine at the True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, California for eight years, and his talent for presenting complex medical topics in a simple, enjoyable format has made him a sought after speaker for health <laughs> conferences worldwide. It's my honor and a joy to present to you Dr. Michael Clapper. Okay. Thank you. Joe, yeah, it was a joke. Uh, how many, uh, how many do you does it take to, to change a light bulb? Uh, two. Uh, one to hold the bulb and one to turn the world around. Okay. Well, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, as you just heard, for the past eight plus years, it's been my pleasure to be on the medical staff at True North Health Center in Santa Rosa, California, about an hour north of the Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, it's a remarkable place. And uh, we see there daily the power of a whole food plant-based diet. And people come in with all the classic Western diseases, the obesity, the clogged arteries, high blood pressure, diabetes, and inflammation of every itis you can imagine. And this is our magic secret here. Uh, we run a whole food plant-based diet, fruit and oatmeal for breakfast, and lunches and dinners of soups and salads and steamed veggies and lentil stews and colorful fruits. And day after day after day, this food without the contaminants of the meats and the dairy, the oils and the refined sugars and the usual toxins in the Western diet, this food day after day sends waves of healing phytonutrients through the patient's cells, meal after meal after meal, as we encourage you to do uh, on your own when you leave here with your own diet. And uh, we see these wonderful clinical responses. It warms the heart, the cockles of these, this old doc. I never did learn where the cockles were in the heart, but, uh, but his are warm. This is my patient, Ken, lovely man. Uh, walked in like this, uh, cholesterol and lipids over the moon, arteries all clogged up, type 2 diabetes, 12 weeks on a whole food plant-based diet, dropped 25 pounds, off his blood pressure medications, off his diabetes meds, and uh, getting an erection for the first time in years because his were clogging all over his body. Uh, and this is routine, we expect this. Yeah, this is the power of a plant-based diet. But it's the what? It's the photographic negative of the toxicity of the standard Western meat and dairy and oil-based diets. It, it creates these grotesque changes in the Homo sapiens body, and you run the, the diet we were meant to run on uh, through that Homo sapiens frame, and they turn back into normal, healthy people without uh, the need for medications, etc. Uh, I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about um, the uh, way to make a whole food plant-based diet work for you. Uh, if any of this goes by quickly, of course, you're uh, going to be able to uh, get the video from uh, the ship here. However, uh, I'm only going to give you part of a longer, larger presentation. I invite you to go to my website, drclapper.com, and click on, uh, click on webinars up here and uh, you'll find one called Thriving on a Plant-Based Diet. And this has a much more uh, complete program. What that uh, uh, contains and what we're going to go through about a third of here, because I want to talk about the paleo issue, which I don't do on the, uh, the Thriving uh, webinar. Uh, so you can pick up the entire uh, program on my website where we talk about uh, <clears throat> 
making plant-based diets work for you, uh, the webinar has, uh, when climate pitfalls, just uh, choosing the wrong foods, which we'll talk about, you, you got to actually eat the healthy foods, uh, how to optimize the absorption of the nutrients, not so easy with some of them. Uh, we're going to talk about avoiding specific nutrient deficiencies, specifically iodine, zinc, magnesium, uh, specific vitamins, B12 and B3, uh, essential fats, DHA, EPA, etc. Uh, things that people do right off the bat that sabotage themselves, and they, they eat three cups of bean chili and complain about the gas, uh, they, uh, they, they eat way too much fruit and, uh, and complain about the loose stools. Uh, you know, you got to make the transition appropriately. Uh, I'm going to be talking later on here about the paleo diet, uh, but uh, this is my... Uh, also, in the uh, presentation, we talk about uh, overweight vegans who are having trouble losing weight. We talk about the underweight vegans who are having trouble uh, keeping the weight on. Uh, I've got folks who talk to me frequently, got cold all the time. My fingers are cold, my hands my toes are cold. I must have bad circulation, right? Wrong. Uh, that, that's not from bad circulation. We talk about that. Uh, I get people talking to me about their nails. Some of them have ridges and splits. We talk about that. So all of that is on the on my webinars version of this video. And so we cover about a third to a half of it here. Uh, if you want to know more about it, you can find it on my uh, on my website. For whatever reasons, people are coming to uh, whole food plant based diets, whether they're concerns about their health, or they don't want to pay for cruelty to animals, or uh, they get concerned about what a meat based diet is doing to our planet. Uh, they find themselves looking for information on how to nourish their body on plant-based materials only. And it's an unusual thought to, because none of us, very few of us, and I doubt any of us in this room were raised as vegans, except some, maybe some of the younger folks here. Uh, and the thought of going without meat and dairy products might be anxiety provoking, and it's certainly almost guaranteed to evoke a negative reaction. Uh, in your friends and family and your doctor. And so people uh, need sometimes a little bit more confidence that it's really the right thing to do. Uh, well, to help build the confidence, I want to start uh, with just a fact of biology, and that is the biggest, strongest, most powerful animals on planet Earth, elephants, buffaloes, giraffes, gorillas, grow to thousands of pounds of mammalian muscle without ever eating cheeseburgers or pepperoni pizzas. Um, all the magnificent muscle of these creatures came from the amino acids uh, that grow out of the ground. You do not have to eat a bull to be as strong as one. Uh, again, this is entirely from plant-based materials. Um, well, he's a bull. They're supposed to be big and strong. I'm concerned about my, my muscle. I don't want to waste away. I don't want to look like one of them puny vegans. Uh, for those of you who need a little confidence on the uh, human muscle side of things, I invite you to, after the lecture, fire up your web browser and type in three words to search on vegan bodybuilders, and then hit images and see who populates your screen. Your screen will fill up uh, with images of magnificent people. Uh, and I would ask, do any of these people strike you as protein deficient? <laughs> I would uh, point out, here's uh, Jim Morris. It's so nice to have Robert with us. What a class act on, on so many levels. He does his profession proud. What a great example. So dear, I guess I him at the Summer Fest last year. What a, what a fine fellow. Uh, here's Jim Morris at age 61. Not too shabby. Here's Jim Morris at age 71. On <laughs> rice and beans and greens, folks. On rice and beans and greens and a lot of sweat in, in the gym. Okay. But the amino acid, the, the protein's in the plant foods. It's in the rice and beef and greens. Relax. Okay. Not an issue. Really not an issue. So, well, let's talk about things I covered in the webinar, but it's of real importance if you want this thing to work for you. First of all, at the risk of stating the obvious, you got to eat the food. It's got to be real food, fresh, whole, vital food. It's got to look like this. Okay. You can't do this on Oreo cookies granola bars and energy drinks. That, that is, that is devitalized processed junk. And as the weeks go by and the months go by, you're going to develop micronutrient deficiencies at these processed 
pieces of dead sugar and fat are not giving you, and it's going to take a toll. And you'll notice your performance for it or medical issues. You're going to start getting skin infections. You're going to get frequent colds. Uh, wounds don't heal. Um, you can't fool Mother Nature. You can't get away with this. You've got to really eat the food. Okay, so uh, no shortcuts here. No energy drinks. No green powders that you put into smoothies is going to rescue you. None of them come close to what's in real live whole foods. There are thousands and thousands of micronutrients that interact in hundreds of millions of synergistic ways. And you, know, you just got to let Mother Nature do her thing, but she's asking, your part of the contract is you got to eat the stuff that has all these micronutrients. So allow whatever you need to do in your busy life, in your bachelor's life, in your uh, <coughs> Uh, the stressful life with kids and whatever, uh, find a way to get some help. Uh, find out your crock pot, you know, got some hearty, healthy soups going, and then freeze them into small Tupperware containers, fill your freezer full of them, and when you don't have time to make a meal, bring out a frozen soup container, heat it, and eat it. Uh, make, a, make a bunch of Jeff Novick's veg veggie burgers and stock the freezer with it. Don't have time to eat, bring them out, heat it, eat it. Keep a big salad going in your fridge all the time. Uh, have some growing fruit in the morning if you're hungry. It's doable, but you got to do it. Okay, do not rely on all the miracle packages and instants and all this stuff. It's going to bite you in the end. This is whole vital food. Whole in that you can recognize it as it was growing on. Yes, that is an apple. That is a, an orange. You can recognize like it's growing in the field. This is a, this is bok choy. You can tell. Okay. Um, this you cannot. This is not whole. This is not alive. It's not vital. And this lie, the vital is not. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. This stuff, this is, this is edible like fruit substances out of brightly colored packages and boxes. See, as, uh, as Michael Pollock says. Okay. When this calls your name in a supermarket, pull out your three word magic wand, point it at the display, and say, that's not food. And, uh, and walk down the soap aisle so you don't have to look at this. Okay. What we're dealing with is what Dr. Goldhammer and Dr. Lyle call the pleasure trap. These foods, the, the crunchy, salty, sugary, non-alive non pieces of sugary, fatty, salty stuff, um, they stimulate the parts of your brain that release oxytocin, serotonin, and dopamine, and all these feel-good chemicals. But they don't do anything for you nutritionally. They are dead pleasure trap food. You are stuck in the pleasure trap like the rat with the electrode going into his brain pushing the pedal. You're stimulating the pleasure center, but it's certainly not nourishing you. In fact, it's doing the opposite. I urge you to get the book by the same name, The Pleasure Trap, uh, and get yourself out of that pit. And uh, there are ways to do it with smart eating. Eat food like it was growing in the field, like potatoes, eat potato chips. Uh, eat potatoes, not potato chips. You like corn, eat corn, not corn chips, and at least half your day, at least once a day, but preferably twice a day, have a big vital salad. Like Dr. Furman says, the salad is the main dish. Yeah, you want a big live one every day. You can't do this all, even on the granolas and the muesli and the veggie burgers. You need vital live food in there. That's what we grew up on a million years ago. We were foraging all day and eating live things, and our body's looking. Uh, for at least half the diet uh, to be live and vital, fresh fruits, fresh salads. So, uh, you got to eat the food. <coughs> you got to then absorb the nutrients. What do I mean by that? That old saying, you are what you eat. It's wrong. Okay. Uh, you're not what you eat, you are what you absorb. If the nutrients in the food do not make it from the food across your intestinal membrane, into your bloodstream, and distribute it to your tissues, you may well not have eaten it. Absorption is the name of the game. And if you don't absorb it, this high fiber food just passes right out through you and into the toilet there. You may well not have eaten it. Absorption's an issue for us. Well, we're eating a high fiber diet here. <clears throat> now, what does that really mean in the real world? Well, it's the difference between animal foods and plant foods. You can tell them looking under the microscope. Uh, here's a muscle cell, and it's got the usual nucleus, mitochondria, and all that. Uh, but um, its its barrier, its uh, limiting membrane, is a very soft, floppy membrane called the cell membrane. Uh, uh, that's uh, easy to pierce uh, with our teeth. Very different than uh, the 
uh, plants under the microscope. You know, put a piece of kale under the microscope, you can tell immediately it's a plant because it has what animals don't have, and that is a cell wall. And this cell wall is what made plants plants, and it's made of cellulose, tough stuff. Plants use it to make their stems and leaves and roots. Trees uh, use it. We cut them down to make paper and two by fours. Cellulose is tough stuff. And we do not have the enzymes to break down cellulose. <coughs> and, and yet all the nutritional goodies that we want, all the vitamins and minerals and proteins are inside the little chamber of cellulose and we don't have the enzymes to break them down. So we got to break down the cell walls. The question is how? Matter of life and health and death, really. Well, Mother Nature comes to our rescue here by giving us 32 of the best juicers on planet Earth, 16 in our upper jaw, 16 in our lower jaw, and the invitation is to use them. Uh, really, seriously, this is high fiber food. You've got to take the extra five seconds with every mouthful to really, like the British say, chew your food to a cream, break it down to a puree, uh, break those cell walls down so your digestive enzymes can get in there so you can absorb the goodies that is why you're eating it. Uh -huh. um, so well, I tell the folks at True North, uh, uh, said, eat, and yeah, you're shoving the food in two chews, bump down those, and then, uh, you know, that you did I eat this plate of food? Slow down. In fact, better yet, quiet. Mm -hmm. Focus. You are now an eater of broccoli. Mm -hmm. Put a fork full of broccoli in your mouth, put the buddy fork down, make broccoli puree in your mouth before you swallow it, taste it, you know, experience being a broccoli eater, uh, and then swallow it. Okay? And then wait a few seconds there before you pick up the fork again. Slow down and be with every mouth or eat consciously. Uh, but take the time to chew that food to a cream so you can absorb the nutrients. Uh, folks who don't have good teeth, then throw them, make up a nice uh, plate of food, throw it in the blender. And we do blended salads, blended soups all the time at the clinic. Works very well. And again, be fully present as you're eating. Uh, <clears throat> other things you can do uh, to optimize the absorption of the vitamins and minerals. Uh, Mother Nature's packed them away pretty solidly in these beans and nuts and seeds and leaves. And there's a lot of fiber in there and a lot of inert starches. We want to start waking those uh, the, the life forces up. What does that mean? Those there are enzymes in that bean that when the spring rains come, uh, those enzymes get active. They start digesting the starches and liberating the sugars and letting the bean grow and sprout. Wonderful. Well, we want to start that process, and that's what the beauty of sprouting is. It's, it wakes those enzymes up. It's time springtime in the sprouting jar. And the enzymes get active and start making sugars appear. And the nuts get sweeter. Almonds are delicious when you soak them overnight. But they're easier to absorb because the enzymes have done some of that early digestion for you. Um, so soak beans and nuts overnight before cooking and increase the assimilation of the nutrients. Uh, sprouting beans and nuts and see the wonderful things it is in the form of pre-digestion. And I'm a big fan of soups and stews. The hot water ruptures the cell walls of the kale, etc. And all these minerals spout into the soup broth. And uh, really, mineral-rich soups and stews are a wonderful thing that everybody should be having their diet. Uh, a couple of things specifically: iron absorption. You can, especially with growing kids or uh, women who are still menstruating, uh, they're losing iron every month. You want they want to increase their iron absorption. You can do it with vitamin C. Does that mean taking a vitamin C tablet with your spinach? No. Uh, it means uh, if you've got a plate of kale or broccoli in front of you, squeeze some lemon juice over it, uh, and the vitamin C will increase the absorption of the iron. If you're making spinach salad, throw some mandarin orange slices in there. Uh, get that citrus and greens combination going, and you'll get more absorption of the iron by a factor of six. <coughs> um, zinc can be a tough one for vegans to get, but uh, if you saute your greens with garlic and onions, uh, it's easier to absorb the zinc. Everybody loves that aroma anyway, but it helps uh, mineral absorption, actually. Uh, and if you, and magnesium is a tough, but very important mineral to get. Uh, if you're cutting up your greens, uh, dice them up, your uh, kale, uh, cabbage, etc. Let them sit on the counter for five or ten minutes. Uh, the enzymes ripen, and uh, uh, and then when you actually serve them, put some balsamic vinegar on them, 
This will allow more nitric oxide to develop with the enzymes that create nitric oxide in your artery walls. <coughs> Iodine is a real issue. And we've all learned to people, I tried to be vegan once, and after six months, I didn't have any energy, I felt bad, and then I started eating some fish, and I felt great. So I either had a fish deficiency, which I doubt, but fish are still in the ocean, and the salmon, etc., and they have lots of iodine. And I suspect at least some of these folks, what we're looking at, what they're telling us, is that they develop an iodine deficiency from uh, uh, not having enough in their diet, and, and, uh, and that caused a problem in this gland and in that called the thyroid. It puts out a hormone called thyroxine, and these four purple globes here represent atoms of iodine, and so every, atom, every molecule of thyroxine is four atoms of iodine on it, and you need it in your diet, and it's serious business. Now, so where do we get it? Um, it's in the soils, and, and healthy soils, especially if they're plowing seaweed back into the soils, they sure it here with good veganic uh, uh, agriculture methods. Uh, there's not a problem because the root vegetables take up the iodine and the carrots and the beets uh, and all the, and the green leafies will take up the, uh, the iodine and some good soil care uh, done by conscious gardeners uh, covers this for you. They should be plowing seed vegetables back into their soil. Uh, if they're not, uh, the, uh, a deficiency can develop here. So, uh, one thing to do, uh, and you, get, you develop signs of hypothyroidism, fatigue, uh, putting on weight, fluid retention, cold all the time. Uh, so what can you do? Well, you can take advantage. These seed vegetables are available at the health food store and uh, seem to still be relatively clean. Uh, one of them is called wakame. You get that at the Japanese restaurant. That's one of my favorite ones. I like their salads. Uh, made of uh, with wakame, and you, you soak the gaba this in your in some fresh water for, for over overnight or the afternoon, and you put a gaba in your soup or your salad two three times a week. That is basically what we're talking about here. Um, another one is called arame. Um, it's a darker variety there, and again you probably run into it in the Japanese restaurant and you soak it up and uh, throw a gaba in your soup or salad two or three times a week. And dulse uh, is another one, uh, so it tastes kind of salty, I like dulse, and, uh, uh, and again, a gallon of your super salad uh, two or three times a week should easily meet your iodine needs. Um, kelp is available, be careful, kelp has so much iodine in it that if you start taking kelp tablets um, or you're using actual kelp leaves, um, you'll flood your thyroid with way too much iodine, you'll cause the very hypothyroidism you're trying to prevent. Um, so that's why they sell kelp in these sprinkle bottles. Just a, just a sprinkle once or twice a week on your salad is enough iodine. Um, and there's another commonly one called hijiki, commonly used. Uh, it takes up arsenic from the ocean. Don't be using hijiki for that reason. Uh, and as we said you know, this morning in the salt lecture, uh, don't depend on your salt, even if it's sea salt, for iodine because it evaporates during drying uh, in the periodic table. Um, iodine is right below chlorine, and you know chlorine evaporates every time you swim in the municipal swimming pool. Uh, well, iodine evaporates in the hot sun, so when they make uh, the, the sea salt, they evaporate the seawater in the hot sun. Well, guess what else evaporates besides the water? The iodine evaporates, and uh, they wind up with, uh, uh, with no iodine. And so, uh, so you need to get iodized sea salt. If you're going to be relying on salt or sea salt for your iodine source, don't assume that pink Himalayan, oh, I'm using Himalayan sea salt, I must be getting plenty of iodine. No, you're not. And uh, you want to get the iodized version of the sea salt. Um, uh, most multivitamins are way too strong. These vitamins build up to high levels, and uh, all of us guys are backing off of it. Vitamin A gives hip fractures, folic acid gives guys prostate cancer, gives women breast cancer, beta carotene increases lung cancer growth. Um, so everybody's backing off of multivitamins, appropriately so. Uh, the only decent one around seems to be Dr. Furman's uh, Women's Daily or Men's Daily. I, have no, I make no money off Dr. Furman's vitamin sales. But what he did, he got rid of the bad stuff. He got rid of the vitamin A, the folic acid, uh, the uh, uh, beta carotene, toned everything else way down to very modest levels. But he did leave in four nutrients that are, were smart. He left in 2,000 of D, smart, 
vitamin K, 30 mics of K2 for your, make sure calcium goes to your bones, not your artery walls. Uh, here he covers your B12 needs with 200 mics of B12. Uh, and here's the 150 mics of iodine from, from kelp. Um, and so, and 15 of, of zinc, which is also to be tested for vegans to get. So he gave some good thought to this. And so if you're going to be doing any multivitamin, uh, this would be the one. But again, I'm, I'm not a show for this vitamin company. I don't connect with these vitamin sales, but that's a well thought out vitamin preparation. If you've got one with the same label, it's, use that one. Uh, then you talk about B12, also in my uh, Thriving on a uh, Plant-Based Diet uh, presentation on my website. And this is important stuff. Vitamin B12 is really important. Um, it's this beautiful lattice uh, symmetrical uh, uh, molecule with this tail sticking down. And you need it to make your blood healthy. You need it to keep your brain healthy. You need it to prevent Alzheimer's disease. You need to keep your spinal cord healthy. It's really important. And if you run short of it, people get dementia and spinal cord degeneration and anemia. So it's a serious business. And I've seen too many vegans over the years with numb fingers and sore tongues and feeling terrible because they neglected this. You don't, don't neglect it. it. It's serious business. Uh, why am I showing you this? Because where does vitamin B12 come from? It comes from bacteria that live in the soil. Okay. The grazing animals, the cows and the sheep and the geese and the steers, buffalo, deer, um, they have B12 in their muscles because they're eating grass all day and they're pulling up uh, clumps of grass that have dirt particles clinging to their roots. And in these soil particles are the microbes that make B12. So the animal, the cow, the sheep, the buffalo, uh, eats uh, the, the microbes and they produce B12. The animal absorbs it into its muscles. You can shoot the cow and get the, strip the flesh off its bones and get vitamin B12, uh, but the cow didn't make it. There was bacterial B12 all along. Okay? It's important to understand that. It's also in the waters in the natural systems. Every rainstorm, you know, these microbes wash into the soil. Well, not only elk get their water from the streams, we used to do that too. And when we were living Earth-connected lives, the uh, same B12 producing organisms were washing through our GI tract and the water that we drank. And we spent most days foraging. We would pull up these starchy roots and tubers and we wouldn't wash them under chlorinated drinking water. Then there would be B12 on the surface of these vegetables and how we eat them. And so nobody, uh, there's uh, in the fossil records of the Neanderthals, there's no empty vitamin B12 supplement bottles at all. There was no reason to take it because they were getting B12. But welcome to the 21st century. Nobody's drinking out streams. Nobody's eating unwashed vegetables. And, and so it's due to modern sanitation that the natural sources of vitamin B12 have been removed from the plant eater's diet. And so that is why that if you are existing solely on plants, then somewhere along the once a week, you need to take something with some B12 in it. Uh, you just take a thousand micrograms of nothing for melanin. Uh, but it's in fortified soy milk, fortified veggie burgers, and it's around. But don't neglect it. And a thousand micrograms, uh, 500, uh, both of those are fine doses. And I like the methylical melanin form. Now, why did I show you the molecular structure of this vitamin? Because as beautiful and functional as it is, there are plants that make similar molecules, but not real B12. And here's one called pseudovitamin B12. Looks pretty close. But if you really follow the tail around, you see this OH is turned into a double bonded O. And um, this, um, uh, uh, this uh, ring here with the nitrogen is now broken open here. It's not the same molecule. So what? Well, it doesn't function like B12, but it occupies the receptor sites uh, on your tissues that B12 would like to plug into, and it keeps the real B12 away. Not a good thing. This is B12 analogs, but a pseudo B12. And there are sea vegetables that make these. Some of these seaweeds make these uh, for their own reason. They're not trying to cause mischief in your life. Uh, but it's probably a good idea those days when you throw the gob of wakame or hijiki, uh, in, or not hijiki, wakame or arame in your soup or your salad, don't take your B12 tap a bad day. Wait, wait for the youth amount of day you're not taking your B12. Just let any uh, analogs clear out of there. 
But speaking of analogs, here's a couple of popular supplements that people use that I would recommend against for this reason, uh, spirulina and blue-green algae. Uh, when they looked at and analyzed spirulina tablets, most of the uh, B12-like molecules were pseudo-B12, it turned out. And uh, the same thing, blue-green algae. Uh, uh, most of it so was pseudo-B12. And so results suggested that these are not suitable for B12 sources. Chlorella seems to be okay, but you don't need any of these, which we know it is. Eat the greens. One nutrient that we seem to need um, is a long chain fatty acid called DHA. And uh, this is you eat your hemp seeds and flax seeds and hope your body makes enough DHA. But your body's not terribly efficient at making this stuff. And when they looked at DHA levels um, in long term Austrian vegans, uh, they were running low, and, there's, and you don't want to develop dementia from DHA deficiency over the years because we're not living near the seashore and, and, and devouring huge amounts of sea vegetables every day, or you're not eating pounds and pounds of, uh, of greens, uh, which would meet these needs. Um, but it's something serious. Um, so uh, the omega-3 fats, they're in the dark leafy greens, so every day you want big helpings, cup, two cup helpings of kale, chard, broccoli, brussels sprout, bok choy, something dark and green at lunch and at dinner. Um, you want a good tablespoon of ground flax seeds on your salad or on your oatmeal. Um, you want to avoid the junky oils, the corn oil, safflower, etc. They steal the enzymes you need to make your own DHA. But um, I take 250 milligrams of DHA uh, in the morning. So I think I've seen enough evidence that it's a little spooky and I don't have that time, much time to eat that many greens. Um, this is the stuff that's in fish oil, but fish don't make it. Fish don't make DHA any more than cows make B12. Um, fish swim in the, the, the DHA, this long chain fatty acid, is made by algae cells, plant cells that float in the ocean. Fish swim in the ocean with their mouths open, swallowing algae all day. And it's the algae DHA that's winding up in the fish's muscle. And when you kill the fish and you crush it, they get the fish oil. That's algal DHA in the first place. Fish didn't make it. Okay? So we should leave the fish off the hook here already. And, uh, and just uh, they're now growing the algae in big vats of pure seawater directly. So they're just harvesting the DHA directly from the algae and leaving the fish off the hook. So, uh, so if you want to, uh, if there's any question, you can get your DHA level, your essential fat in your blood, tested. Uh, here's one from Genova Labs. Your doctor can order this. Uh, you can probably just get it done off uh, online. There's a number of labs that offer this. And they send you a little kit with a stylet and some cards. And uh, uh, you stick your finger and you fill up the four circles and send it back. And you get a readout of your omega-3s and omega-6s, etc. So if there's any question, you can get uh, test your own, or you can just start taking it. As I said, I take uh, 250 milligrams of, not, not these brands, but another brand. Uh, but, uh, so that's my whole supplement program. There's a couple of Dr. Furman's multivites and, and, a, and a vegan DHA, and I'm, and I'm done. And I think that's all anybody really needs to do. Gotta move, man, don't let your muscles atrophy, don't let your joints stiffen up. Nothing says old man or old woman and someone who's like their spine stiffen up and their back stiffen up. Man, take those yoga classes, take those Tai Chi classes. <coughs> Lecturing is hard on the spine as well. <laughs> um, do you need any blood tests as a long-term vegan? Yeah, for a few years, but if they're consistently coming back normal, I, I would space them way out here. I would get a complete blood count. Find out what your liver and kidney are doing in, in their metabolic profile. Get a thyroid, just make sure that you're getting enough iodine. Check your B12, and if you don't have enough B12, then MMA and homocysteine goes up, so get all three of those checked. Uh, check your vitamin D level. And um, if you're not doing great after a year, then send off a fatty acid profile and an amino acid profile, which I'll show you in a minute. But most folks, this done every two, three, four years, if they're all normal, that's all you really need. Uh, if you're not thriving, check your fatty acids, and, uh, and there are amino acid profiles that you can also get through Genova Labs and Dr. Data, all the other labs here. Uh, if you think it's from not enough protein in your diet, you can send off one of these uh, blood tests, 
uh, on a vegan diet, then eat a bunch of meat for three days, and then send off another one and see which one, see which of these changed here. Uh, I've done that once or twice. But to bring this around to this guy, all of us have probably run into someone saying something like this. I tried to be vegan once, it didn't work for me. Now I eat meat and I feel better. This is a real issue. Uh, so I'm going to tell you that everything else uh, regarding skinny vegans and overweight vegans and cracked nails and all that stuff, if you're interested in that stuff, uh, go to my website and go see if I have a plant based diet. I want to spend the rest of this time talking to you about the paleo approach uh, that I think is causing so much damage and so much confusion uh, and is swinging a pendulum way over that's going to hurt a lot of people when it swings way back. Paleo philosophy, if you're not familiar with it, <clears throat> says that we shouldn't be eating anything that our Paleolithic ancestors, the cro magnons and the Neanderthal folks, weren't eating. And the implication, this image that that conjures up, uh, the mighty hunter in the front of his cave uh, with a prostate, prostrate woman over by the hair and a, and a big piece of mammoth meat in the other hand, and about to drag them both into the cave. And this, is, this was man at its, at its primitive best. And from this image comes the implication. There were no packages, etc. You, you need to be eating meat with every meal, and if they could find some grasses around the mouth of the cave, then you can have something green too. But they were, they were, they were a cave man, rat. We ate meat like every, every Neanderthal had a mastodon in the freezer and spent all day eating mammoth meat. That's what we do. And this is translated now to modern times. And with the exception of most of the people in this room, most Americans eat a piece of animal flesh three times a day. A meal is not viewed as complete unless there's a piece of animal muscle in the middle of the plate. Bacon and eggs, egg and muffin for breakfast, cheeseburgers for lunch, chicken for dinner, or fish for dinner. Most people in the West eat a piece of animal muscle three times a day. And we view this as normal. If there's not a piece of animal flesh in the old plate, hey, where's my protein? Hey. Let me point out how abnormal this is that we have taken to be normal. If you think about it, not even mountain lions eat flesh three times a day. The tigers in the rainforest, official carnivores, do not eat flesh three times a day. They don't eat it every day. Well, once a week if they can get it. Most days they wind up fasting. They get enough meat. No advanced primate eats animal flesh at all. You do not see bands of gorillas surrounding a gazelle and wrestling to the ground there and just tearing its flesh. Don't do that. Sure don't eat, they don't feed their young animal flesh three times a day, like we do. What is normal here? What is natural? No matter what the paleo folks tell us, in no ways have we become homo carnivorous. We have not become the carnivorous animals. Our simian, our ape ancestors and cousins, have been on this planet for 30 million years. Our bonobo and gorilla cousins are up in the trees right now as we speak, eating fruits and leaves like they've done for the past 30 million years, and like our digestive system has been designed to digest. We did not suddenly mutate two million years ago to become the carnivorous ape. Our saliva still contains starch-digesting enzymes. The mitochondria in our muscle cells, that still their preferred fuel is glucose. We are sugar-burning organisms, not fat-burning organisms. Our intestines are still 22 feet long to digest high-fiber diets, not the short intestines of mountain lions and tigers. On every level, our anatomy screams herbivore, and if you need convincing beliefs, Go to YouTube and see the excellent presentation by my colleague, Dr. Milton Mills, 
is man an herbivore or omnivore? And he will convince you six ways from Sundays, there's no question, will you have in your river's body. Now, when the paleo folks hear this, the uh, first thing they do, point to their canine teeth, say, aha, what about these? Why were you giving canine teeth if we weren't supposed to be eating animal flesh? To which I say, you want to see human dentition. Here's all 32 teeth that a dental pen on the ground. And I see flat, evenly uh, sized teeth, no big fangs sticking down from the top or up from the bottom, flat grinding molar teeth. Canine teeth, if you look in the mirror, you'll see that your canines are shorter than your central incisors. Your canines are shorter than your central incisors. You want to see a pair of canine teeth? Hey, Brown's Kenny. Open her mouth. If your teeth, your canines look like this, go into the nearest butcher shop you see, buy a big slab of porterhouse steaks, walk outside, rip off the paper, and have at it, you know? These are canines. Once you've got te canines like this, don't talk to me about, about your, your canine teeth. You give me permission to eat animal flesh. But you know what? These canines and our molars are were superbly designed for where we really got our calories. If you take the time to go to Africa, like anthropologist Nathaniel Dominey did from Dartmouth, and you actually analyze the skulls of the Cro-Magnon and the Neanderthals, what you find in between their teeth are starch grains, because that's what got us through. The majority of calories brought into the camps of the Neanderthals and the Cro-Magnons were not brought in by the guys. Most Hunts were unsuccessful. Most times the guys came back empty handed. If they did drag a carcass in, it rotted, but then they became toxic with no refrigeration. The truth is, most of the calories, when you examine the fecal droppings that are fossilized now, the coprolites, you can tell the massive amount of fiber these people ate. The truth is that most of the calories brought into the Paleolithic camp were gathered by the women. We spent all day gathering roots and tubers and starchy corns and edible grasses and acorns and berries. Once again, the women got us through the tough times, and our teeth are superbly engineered to digest the food that we really ate. This whole mighty hunter mythos is, is a mythos. It never happened. We barely eat through the winters, eating the, the, the gathered up starchy roots that the women gathered. Well, I got some problems with the paleo diet as a physician. <clears throat> not only do I not think it's based on any real science, real anthropological history, but as a physician, I got some concerns, and you ought to know if you are dabbling or even thinking about it with this diet. First of all, you're going to be running on fats as your main fuel. <clears throat> fats are not clean burning like sugars uh, that, treat, that leave your body in carbon dioxide and your breath and water in your urine. Uh, you burn fat, you're going to wind up with acidic molecules like acetoacetate, beta hydroxybutyric acid, and acetone. So that makes burning fat a chronic acid load for the body to deal with. This is hard on the bones, a good chance these folks are going to wind up with low bone density. It's hard on the liver, it's hard on the kidneys. These folks are with all this animal flesh, you're getting a huge amount of DNA that turns into uric acid. Uh, and these folks are going to have a nasty incidence of kidney stones and tophaceous gout. <clears throat> High protein diets are toxic to the kidneys. Ask any nephrologist worth his tofu, worth what he has, someone coming in with kidney failure, the first thing they do, you put them on a low protein diet. Those amino acids slamming into the kidney glomeruli line hurt it, including these protein powders including the vegan protein powders, scare me. They're not natural stuff and they're hard on the kidneys, but these folks are eating a high protein diet year after year after year. Your house cats, kidneys can handle it. We homo sapiens, it's a ticket to the dialysis machine. Then we got a molecule called carnage. This is a real issue. The food we eat determines the microbes that live in our gut, the microbiome. If your, if most every meal is based on a piece of animal flesh or, or hen's egg, 
that in the muscles of these animals, you're eating a lot of a molecule called carnitine, and in the eggs, you're eating choline. You're going to summon up a bunch of microbes in your colon that eat carnitine and choline. They have names like Peptostreptococci and Clostridia, and they don't care about you. And they're waiting for that next chicken breast or salmon steak to come down because they will turn the carnitine and the choline into this molecule called trimethylamine. So what? Well, your liver turns that into trimethylamine oxide. This is a molecule from hell. This drives cholesterol into the artery walls. And the folks on the paleo diet, I recall, Buff at the gym there, these are the guys who dropped dead on a treadmill at age 49. <gasps> oh, he looked so healthy. But what was happening inside his arteries? He was aging himself badly. Oh, his cholesterol went down on the, where did it go? <laughs> went into his artery walls. This is, your, your house cat will never develop this. Mountain lions never develop this. But we don't adapt to a flesh-based diet, and this is one of the sequelae. Then we've got a lovely molecule called endotoxin. What's that? I'm sorry for one slaughterhouse picture here, but there's a reality here. And that is all meat comes from the slaughterhouse, even organic grass that beef. They get shot in the head, and they must get eviscerated. The guts have to be pulled out. And when this happens, the intestinal bacteria leak out. And the truth is, every cutting surface in the slaughterhouse has a covering of, of gram-negative bacteria, E. coli, Shigella, Salmonella, uh, every cellophane wrap package of chicken and veal and turkey uh, has, has, is covered with bacteria. Why am I telling you this yucky thing? because these bacteria dry up and die. And when they do, their cell walls break up into these nasty molecule, a lipopolysaccharide, called endotoxin. This is bad stuff. This stuff causes chaos all over the body. It releases histamine, it releases inflammatory uh, uh, cytokines, it depresses heart muscle, it, may, it causes blood clotting. Uh, this is a nasty, nasty molecule, and it's heat stable. Cooking the burger doesn't make this go away. And our paleo friends are eating this three times a day. And it makes the gut leaky. And as a result, food proteins start leaking out and flowing through joint membranes, and you wind up with the old leaky gut situation with such a for autoimmune diseases. Then once the autoimmune diseases start up, there's this nasty molecule found only in animal flesh called NU5GC. Uh, it sets off inflammation throughout the body, the stain for it. You find it in all these inflammatory cases. And our paleo folks are eating this three times a day. And there's no question, it's, it's a nasty sialic acid that causes uh, a lot of problems. High fat diets, Dr. Barnard's been telling us, clog up your insulin receptors and make you insulin resistant and the intramyosinous lipid. Uh, clogs up insulin receptors, and these folks are eating a high-fat diet and think it's a good thing. They're creating type 2 diabetes. And the very act of cooking animal flesh causes free radicals and nitrosamines um, that set off colon cancer and inflammatory bowel disease. Someone said, Doc, I want to cause a colon cancer. How can I do this? Simple. Thank you, Colin, for me two, three times a day. Let them remind your colon wall for decades see what you set off in there. So acts as the most colon cancer start in the descending and sigmoid colon. That's where the exposure time is the longest. Uh, but uh, inflammatory bowel disease, uh, also animal fats and sugars, etc., uh, makes uh, makes these things worse. <laughs> the truth is, I don't care how buff these guys look. <clears throat> this is a diet of death. <clears throat> if they are. Basing the diet on animal flesh, and any standard American basing the diet on animal flesh, they can make cheaper, you're doing that, that's the center of your meals. You are choosing a fuel mixture that's, that every five hours sends oxidized muscle proteins and new 5 gc and endotypes and TMAO and, and carcinogens, and these animals are fed herbicides and pesticides that concentrate in their flesh, the antibiotics, the growth work, you're choosing to put this in your bloodstream, hour after hour, day after day, <laughs> year after year. Now, these folks may initially lose some weight. 
because the paleo folks say some things I agree with. They say, no, no, the caveman ever put olive oil on a suit, they're down on oils. They're down on dairy products. No caveman ever milked the dairy cow, they're down on dairy. And they're down on flour products. No caveman ever ground wheat into flour and made donut. And so, so I agree with them, hey, paleo. And you drop the, the flour, the, the dairy, and the oil out of your diet, you'll trim down, and that'll lower your cholesterol, and that'll make you feel better, and yay, wonderful. But have no illusion, none of these paleo authorities have followed people five years, 10, 15, 20 years. Dr. Esselstyn has, plant-based diet has been around for centuries. We know that works. But an animal flesh-based diet has never been done before, not to this extent. The ones, our version of it is lethal enough. But this is a diet of death. Kills the animals, for sure. Kills the people who eat it. These folks are setting themselves up for an epidemic of colon cancer, and heart attacks, and strokes, and autoimmune diseases, and diabetes, inflammatory bowel disease. I don't care that their cholesterol, my LDL got better, and for some three months on a I don't care. You follow these people over the, over the months and years, there's going to be a late, I've already seen my first colon cancer in a paleo woman. It ain't going to be the last, I fear. Do not get seduced by this and, and don't get impressed by the initial improvements that may show up. This is because the original diet is so crappy. But these folks are, are uh, this is a non-sustainable diet on every level, not only medically, but it's going to kill this planet. Are these people with a straight face proposing a flesh-based meal three times a day for eight billion people on planet Earth? Paleo's the best diet. Everybody ought to be eating paleo. Three times a day for eight billion people. It would take three planet Earths to do that. For the taste of flesh, this planet is dying. Take environmental devastation, it's why they're cutting down the industrial, large-scale industrial agriculture is driving every single environmental threat in the face. It's why the forests are being cut down. It's why the soil is eroding. Uh, that's where most of the water is going. Most of the polluted water is from pesticides and herbicides and manure. Uh, most pesticides and herbicides are sprayed on corn soybean fields for, for cheap cheeseburgers. Most species are being driven extinction to uh, make way for, for agricultural land. And most of the greenhouse, most of the climate change, is from 70 billion living animals on planet Earth that we create each year, all breathing out carbon dioxide, all belching out methane, all eating grains that are made with ammonia fertilizers that put nitrous oxide in the air. Most of the greenhouse gases are coming from our industrial production of animal flesh. That's why these bears are on the, on the iceberg, uh, because of our insatiable lust for, for the flesh of animals. And we are clear cutting the ocean. I went about fish. We are strip mining the ocean. It's got a five mile long fishing nets. For every piece of salmon on your plate, wild caught salmon, there are seabirds drowning nets and whales and sea turtles and dolphins all drown uh, to put that to wild caught fish on your plate. If you want to read about this, I urge you to get not only John Robbins, I've some book Dying for New America, uh, the United Nations and World Bank has some excellent features. But the best book, I urge you, if you want to educate yourself on this, and I urge that you do, is go to the website of Dr. Richard Oppenland called ComfortablyUnaware.com. And his book is called Comfortably Unaware, which is exactly where the meat and dairy industries want us. And I urge you to watch the videos on his website and read his books, support his work. Uh, it's arguably the most important uh, thing that we can do these days. So where does it all begin? How about that guy who I, I tried to be a vegan once and it didn't work and he ate some meat and he's feeling better. Now either all the people with this experience got together and said, let's drive Dr. Clapper nuts. And let's all tell them that we felt bad on a vegan diet or yeah, we feel better eating meat. Or they're trying to tell us some, something about human physiology that we need to understand. So what is it, this meat hunger? that the failed vegans and the folks who relapse, who I walk past the barbecue smell so good, I just I couldn't help myself. What is it? Here's my thoughts. My theory is that the issue starts like most everything else in life, in our early, early childhood. Age six months. The baby's still nursing on the breast. 
still nursing from the bottle. And with all the love in the mother's heart and the father's heart, no malice, your mother didn't know, my mother didn't know, but with all the care and cherishing in their heart, that bottle of baby lamb, baby veal, baby chicken is open at age six months. And from that point on, three times a day, every six hours, animal flesh, slathered on that, children, that child's intestinal tract. All through infancy, by age two, three, they're in McDonald's eating their Happy Meals. They've got a, a flesh-based diet. Three times a day, throughout through their infancy, childhood, adolescence, puberty, their teen years, their 20s, their 30s. You eat animal flesh three times a day for 30 years. Don't you think your, your body's going to adapt to that fuel mixture? It's high in fat, high in protein, low in fiber, high in sugar. Well, your intestinal mucus will be the best. It will set up to be the most efficient absorbing nutrients out of this high fat, high protein, high sugar food stream. Your liver enzymes will set up to be the most efficient dealing with this high fat, high protein, high sugar food stream. The intestinal microbes will, will certainly have a habit of uh, dealing with the particular flesh-based food stream. The body will get a metabolic set. And very important, because we're talking about the muscles of animals, three times a day you're flooding the body with molecules like carnitine, creatine, myoglobin. These are animal muscle-based nutrients. Your body makes carnitine, creatine, myelo, etc., but if it's coming in three times a day, preformed, since childhood, what do you think this child's genes are going to do? They're going to downregulate. We don't have to make this stuff our own. The blood's full of carnitine all the time. It's full of creatine all the time. It's full of myelo. We don't have to make it. And so she downregulates, and she needs to. She doesn't want to make more carnitine. She's going to wind up generating TMAO. So her body and its wisdom turns down its own manufactured carnitine. Brilliant. But for 30 years, she has been eating carnitine three times a day. And I'm not saying we should go out and buy carnitine tablets. That's a shorthand for hundreds of muscle-based nutrients that you can make yourself but get down-regulated if you introduce this into an infant's metabolism. Then, what happens? At age 35, you see forks over knives, you, you go and take a cruise like this, the, the plant-based life goes on. And this person, who now is physically dependent upon these nutrients, they adopt a plant-based diet, and suddenly they've done a 180 degree turn on the food stream. Instead of high in fiber, low, instead of low in fiber, it's high in fiber. Instead of high in protein, low in protein. Instead of High in fat, low in fat, instead of, low in, instead of high in simple sugars, low in simple sugars. And all those muscle-related nutrients, caught. Poof, overnight. Now you've got to make your own, right now. Gear up your enzymes, got to do it your own. Most people can do it, but some can't right away. Might take some folks three months, six months to gear up their enzymes. And during this time, they'll feel it. They'll draw down on their own stores and they don't feel so great, then they eat some meat, and all that preformed garden ingredient and all that stuff flows to their tissues. Oh, oh, I feel great. I'm a carnitine, I'm a, I'm a carnivore. I'm a paleo, vegan, vegan, man, I need my meat. And, and in his experience, he does. But what are we watching? This is not normal human physiology. This is an acquired dependency that was created by feeding a human infant the flesh of animals three times a day since, since infancy. You can create someone with a dependency on this, so what? You can create with a dependency on heroin, a lot of molecules. But don't think this is human physiology. Because you know who doesn't get meat cravings? The people that raised as vegans since. I've, I'm now old on rates. I've delivered three generations. I've delivered myself, little babies. And watching them grow up, it's healthy, strong, vegan kids. And they marry other young vegan folks and have vegan kids on their own. Their mouths don't water when they walk past a barbecue. They're not thinking about steaks and chops. They eat plants. They are a different physiologic creature. So, 
in my opinion, what we're watching is an acquired dependency. This young woman, if she continues to eat a whole food plant-based diet, should never become obese. Her arteries should never clog up. She should never develop high blood pressure. She should never develop type 2 diabetes. These are the standard diseases from eating a flesh, dairy, oil-based diet. It's the food, but the plaque in my office says it. It's the food. It's been the food all along. You know, that's the place to look. Now, some folks are going to take them some time to gear up the, like turning an ocean liner. And some folks uh, may take them a few months uh, to, get, to get on a plant-based bandwagon. That's okay. <clears throat> some people may require a longer transition time, some many months. It's all right. No fingers wagging. I didn't become vegan until I was 35. So for 35 years, I ate flesh and animals. And, and I know what it's like to sleep that sleep. It's me. You, know, you need me, don't you? You know, never to let it go on. And so there's no, this is not about judgment. So what do I tell the patient in my office? I got I to eat some meat twice a week. Say, okay, you do, you probably do at this point. Probably got some good quality and dependency on it. So here's what I tell my folks. If you think your body requires an animal protein, fair enough. Consider it medicinal. Your body, now there's, there are actual nutrients in there that your body does require. Okay, fair enough. You're not eating a 16 ounce porterhouse because you like that juicy taste. You should treat animal flesh like a very expensive vitamin tablet. that's toxic in large amounts. You don't eat handfuls of multivitamins. Don't eat big slabs of flesh. I tell them find the smallest amount of animal flesh you think your body got about the size of a deck of playing cards producing the least injurious way. I don't know what that means, especially as far as the animal goes. And consume it as seldom as you can. Fall a little piece on Monday. Coast on that Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, until you think you may need some more. And have another little piece. And coast on that two, three, four, five, six days, as long as you can. If you do that, they should feel pretty functional. And we're doing a tap dance uh, till their enzymes gear up, till their genes become disinhibited, and their enzymes wake up, and they make their own carnitine, great deal of the stuff. And so it takes a few months of care. It's fine. In fact, they're doing it at all. You know, uh, there's a saying that when the dog plays the violin, don't criticize the quality of the play. You know? Thank <laughs> 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 playing it all. It's wonderful. You know, and fine. Because what happens if they're trying to they're make it since your effort? You, you see them back two months later, now well, only once a week, I have some on Sunday night. Okay, fine. You see them a few months later, now I only have it twice last month. Uh, we have, we're going to have doing it every other Sunday now. And you see them a few months later, ah, we stop buying this stuff. And, uh, no, not even appetizing. And it, it fades out of the diet and certain times gear up. So, uh, I urge people to work towards a study it all together. If someone eats animal flesh more than a few times a, a week, if you eat more, animal flesh more than a few times a week, and certainly if you eat it more than a few times a day, it's not because your body needs some animal protein. Because you like the taste of flesh in your mouth. And it's an expensive and dangerous habit that threatens not only the health of that person, but the future of all of us who care about life on this planet. We've got to go from our current animal-based diet to a plant-based diet. What do we have tonight? We have a meat burritos, we have a lentil stew, we have a veg burgers tonight. There's a whole world of plant-based cuisine when you adopt this uh, strategy. Uh, the changes are stunning, uh, what we see. And the obesity melts away, and the arteries open up, and the high blood pressure comes down, and the diabetes goes away, and the joints stop hurting, and the psoriasis clears, and the asthma stops wheezing, and the migraine headaches go away. And, and the psoriatic arthritis stops hurting, and they've turned back into normal, healthy people who don't need the services of people like me. When I, when I talk to folks at True North, I say, you know, it's wonderful you're here. I want to see you people again. Uh, I want to see you in two places, uh, the health food store and the bike path. That's the only place I want to see you. And, uh, and again, my friend Ken really responded well. We've seen big changes before. We've got to change everything. And it starts with your buying habits. It starts with what you as you're pushing that cart down the aisle, what you're putting in that basket is what's going to determine your health and the economy and, uh, and what you order in the restaurant. Because every time 
someone turns to the waiter or the waitress and says, I don't have the beef, I don't have the chicken, I don't have the veal, I don't have the lamb. Your children's world gets a little hotter, a little drier, a little deader. We got to stop pretending that these animals come from the farm. They come from our children's future. Every child I see in our store, I feel like running up and apologizing to for what we have done to their future in their lives. And the one thing we can do is to eat a plant-based diet, have it become the norm. We've got to make eating flesh as uncool as smoking cigarettes and wearing fur. And the young people have to be saying to each other, and they are starting to now, you still eat meat, don't know that man, that's so uncool. And that's the change that's going to happen. And now Tyson Chicken just bought a 10% uh, interest in, in Impossible Foods. And Beast, Beast Burgers, they see the handwriting on the wall. Uh, the animal industry's days are numbered, but it all, but we have to make it the norm. And if you, what we have seen in our lifetimes, when I grew up, the Berlin Wall was going to be there forever, boy, this was a nasty a symbol of in, intractable power. And, but uh, 30 years of uh, trade with the West and blue jeans and Beatles music, and it came down in a weekend in 1989. And I was just, we were just in Berlin last summer, Elise and I, and what a hip place to be a vegan. They got vegan department stores, vegan restaurants everywhere, and it is so fitting somehow. But if Germany can change, and certainly we can. Uh, there's lots of good changes to be had. So um, I'll invite you to go to my uh, website. Uh, uh, I've had an article called My Problems with Paleo. And if you want to read basically what I just told you, that's on my website. And I'm subscribing on a plant-based diet. So um, that is the major thing I want to share with you. But I think with a little luck that we've got some, we've got a, few, a few minutes for questions. Uh, someone have a microphone here? OK. Um, what is leaky gut? What is leaky gut? Uh, the, intestine, the intestinal tract uh, has, a, has a double function. It's the organ through which we absorb nutrients into our bloodstream. But there's a barrier function. There's a lot of stuff in your gut, in your intestine, you don't want out in your bloodstream. Uh, undigested food proteins that break down the product of bacteria. And a healthy gut wall will not let these nasty molecules uh, into the bloodstream. Uh, we do things to injure the gut, we drink alcohol, we take antibiotics, we drink chlorinated water, we eat too much sugar, uh, we allow nasty bacteria to grow. They injure the gut wall and allow these molecules to get out of the bloodstream, flow through our joints, set off autoimmune diseases, all sorts of different types of problems. Uh, I have a webinar um, called Leaky Gut, and uh, so I urge you to see that one as well and go into the detail. Yes? I thought the keto diet was kind of replacing the paleo diet. The ketogenic diet is replacing the paleo diet. Um, and I think, in my mind, it's a distinction without a difference. Uh, if they want you to stay in ketosis month after month after month, this is a recipe for metabolic disaster, as far as I can see. A, a brief stay in ketosis for a week, two weeks, three weeks, does wonderful things. And I'm sure back a million years ago on the African plains, it may have been a week or 10 days before you found the next berry bush with fruit on it or the next carpet's rotting in the sun. And 10-day fasts were, were the, probably the routine. And we went into ketosis. And good things happened you know, with a brief stint of ketosis. It cleans you out on a cellular level. It turns off inflammation. turns off cancer growth. Cool. Um, but you don't want to stay in ketosis month after month after month. It's like driving your car from LA to Seattle in passing gear. It is hard on the system. And these folks don't know what they're really saying. They've never kept anybody ketosis for six months or a year. Uh, I, I hope they have good enough practice insurance and are willing to pay these folks on nephrology bills. They're going to put some people in the ICU and some people on a dialysis machine uh, with this kind of advice. This is not the natural state of humans. We are carbohydrate burning organisms, not fat burning organisms. Hi, uh, you kind of already answered the question, but for weight loss, uh, would a brief stint in ketosis, like two, like two to three weeks, but vegan ketosis, obviously, so just high uh, quantity of avocados and coconut and stuff like that, 
Is that in terms of health for weight loss something that you would recommend, like two to three week stints every few months, or yeah? Can you do a vegan keto ketonic diet? Is that what you're asking? Do I recommend it for health? Uh, uh, we talked this morning, the concept of intermittent fasting, uh, to do a five-day water fast once a month, great thing to do. Everybody should do that. My wife and I are going to start doing that. And it's a wonderful thing. Five days on water, cleans you out, you put your tiptoe into ketosis for, a few days, for 48 hours, uh, really cleans you out, makes you feel great. That's, I think, as far as you should take that. But, you know, we're Americans, and oil is good, more or should be better, right? Uh, in five days, just go ahead and how about 50 days? Uh, uh, that's not the point, but these intermittent fasts, and they kind of recapitulate that ancient rhythm back a million years ago with the, where we just had to fast for five days before we found the next meal. And our body's used to that. That's a, that's a good thing to do, to hold it in bed. Weight loss happens from the food you eat, not from the water, not from the water fast. Hey, you talked about putting uh, iodine back in the soy, but the question that came up earlier was, if we're eating seaweed and Fukushima is putting out radiation into the ocean, is that a problem? Does the seaweed absorb the radiation? Thank you. Mm, valid question about Fukushima and the uh, uh, absorption of radiation. Uh, there's, I don't see any way around this. Uh, if, if you're actually going to be eating it, uh, then get the, pa the package of whatever brand, Maine Coast or whoever it is, and get on their website, because the reputable ones are testing for radioactivity as well as arsenic and heavy metals, and find out what their scientific analysis is, uh, the, the good companies. I, I know Maine Coast is the so it's a pretty good right now, and they seem to be pretty responsible. But it's an issue, keep looking on the website, and keep Googling iodine and sea, sea vegetables, and radioactive iodine in the series to find out what. Welcome to the 21st century. Yes. Yes. Uh, you said that folic acid was not good for you. Is that correct? If what's a good topic? Uh, you said something a while ago about folic acid not being a good thing. Folic acid. Yes. Right. Uh, no. You don't want to be consuming folic acid. I thought it sounds a good thing, and pregnant women should take it. No, they shouldn't. Uh, what they should consume is folate. Folate uh, is a natural substance made by dark green leafy plants. That's where the name comes from. It's from foliage. And so this is folate. And it's a really important vitamin. And it uh, helps you metabolize vitamin B12 and all sorts of important things. Um, the problem is that it's in dark green leafy vegetables. Uh, but uh, if the vegetables spoil and people don't eat them, uh, then you don't, uh, you don't get the advantage in developing immunes, etc. So let's fortify it. Let's put it into, into uh, vitamin tablets and into bread. The problem is folate um, breaks up. It's a fairly fragile vitamin. But if you do a little synthetic twist on it, you can turn it into folic acid. Ooh, that's shelf stable. And so uh, they're the same thing. The public will never know, right? And so that's what they're really supplementing with in the vitamin tablets and the bread is folic acid. And we thought, oh, folate, folic acid, folate, same thing, right? Oh, when their science says theoretically it's the same, but what happens to people who really eat this stuff for 20 years? Well, it turns out the women get breast cancers and the guys get prostate cancers, but they actually follow the folic acid eaters. And so now they start to pull the folic acid out. Not nice to fool Mother Nature. So folate is what, what you want. And you get that by, as I said earlier, once a day you want a big, if something helping, if something dark is green, every day, twice a day is even better. But they have some kale, chard, broccoli, muscat, and asparagus. You can uh, keep that folate flowing through you there, and it won't be a problem. It's like folic acid, it's the synthetic uh, and carcinogenic form of folate. Yes. Yeah. Um, what do you think about the uh, blood type diet? Um, right. Um, I think, like Dr. Gray said, it's, uh, it's uh, medical astrology. You know, what's your, what's your sign? What's your blood type? Um, they're really. Uh, there, there really is no science behind it. Uh, the, when you look at the killer diseases, diabetes, uh, uh, heart attacks, strokes, whatever, um, they're evenly distributed from all, all the blood types, A, B, O, they all get the same incidence of diabetes, high blood pressure, et cetera. Um, squirrels have 11 different blood types, so what? It, it, it really doesn't matter. Uh, and you know that's not the issue. But people, oh, I'm a type O, oh, that means I can eat meat, oh, type A, better not eat their bread. Um, it's silly, uh, and uh, if you, and I wrote a long article on this, if you Google, do a Google search, 
on clapper and, and blood type guy. You'll see the article that I wrote on it. Yes. Two questions, please. First on iodine. Uh, for some of us who don't eat the seaweed, can you address taking drops of NASA iodine and or a quarter cup of cranberries is said to have 400 micrograms of iodine? Second question, to your point about the bonobos eating fruits and leaves. You know, no other animal on the planet cooks its food. Legumes are typically toxic, most beans and uh, we would not necessarily thrive in a field of raw grains. Is there any downside to those people who might thrive on an abundant amount of leafy greens and fruit to the exclusion of everything else? No, if you eat enough leafy greens and fruit, you'll thrive. There's no question about it. And you'll poop about 12 times a day and uh, you'll thrive. <laughs> Uh, she's, she's implying there's this issue now with African green, oh, don't eat legumes, they've got lectins, ooh, they'll, they'll come and get you in the middle of the night, they'll sneak into your bed and strangle you. Uh, these lectins um, are carbohydrates in well, most plants, and many animals make lectins. Um, and uh, they can uh, uh, cause inflammation and interference and absorption if you eat a lot of them. The point is they're destroyed by cooking. Uh, and nobody's eating raw beans. We urge you do not eat raw beans. And, and, uh, and uh, any sprouted lentils should be, be sprouted for at least three, four days. But basically, uh, all bean, all legumes, beans, peas, chickpeas, lentils should be cooked soft enough so you can squish them between your fingers. If you do that, legumes are not an issue. And when, if you read uh, Dan Dubner's book, The Blue Zones, when he goes around the world and looks at where people live the longest, and, and examines their diet, guess what every one of the longest alive people on the planet are eating? Well, you know, it's all eating beans. And if legumes were so toxic, uh, then you wouldn't see the Okinawans and the and the and the people in the Greek islands eating all these beans and living to a hundred. Uh, it just it doesn't hold water in the real world. Uh, uh, enjoy, uh, you know, so, so in there cooking well, but uh, enjoy your, your legumes and don't worry about the legumes. The iodine, what was the question about the iodine? Taking NASA and iodine drops or cranberries? Uh, iodine drops? Yes, NASA and iodine or quarter cup of cranberries. What, I'm sorry? Cranberries. Uh, so iodine and cranberry. I hear there is a modest amount. Um, if there's any question, you can get your iodine level check, have your doctor. The best test is a, is a overnight urine collection. Um, and uh, if you want to do the deluxe version, you, we should excrete about 100 micrograms of iodine every 24 hours. Um, if there's none in your urine, then you definitely are short. Um, but they usually give you 100 micrograms to take. And if you're, and if you're fully repleting your body, then all 100 micrograms show up in your urine the next morning. If none of it shows up, then, you, then you're short of the stuff and you, and you better uh, take some supplements. So you can get an iodine tolerance test uh, if you like, and, and that's a good way. But just check your blood or your, your urine iodine is a good thing to do. Um, be careful with these blue balls drops. They, one drop contains a lot of iodine. Uh, don't be taking them every day. Once or twice a week, give that. Uh, and, if, and if cranberries have 400 micrograms, uh, you only need about 100, 150 micrograms of iodine a day. Uh, a cup of that a day would probably help both your bladder and your, and your thyroid. Uh, right. Probiotics and nice shades. Right, probiotics. Um, if you go to my website and you see my probiotic, my website, my uh, uh, webinar on leaky gut, I go into the whole probiotic in detail there. Uh, but they're not necessary for most people. The most important thing is the food you eat. The good microbes are already down in your gut. It's the rice and the beans and the greens and the good foods that you put down there that summons them up and makes them robust, like the orchestra conductor bringing up the brass and the woodwinds, you know, the, the rice and the beans and the green, mm, makes your body microbiome blue. And that's all you really need to do. If you've just taken a week of antibiotics for a chest infection, whatever, yes, then a probiotic would be helpful, uh, maybe after intestinal infection. But other than that, most people don't need it. It's the prebiotics that make the difference, the food you eat. Yes. Could you speak a little bit about osteoporosis, the prevention and or reversal with plant-based? Uh, I'm going to speak for an hour and a half on that. Uh, I think Sunday it's called Healthy Bones. I'm, I'm going to give my entire Healthy Bones presentation on osteoporosis because it's so important to the second one today to ask me about it. So come to my Healthy Bones presentation. But I also have Healthy Bones on my 
Uh, well, yeah, if you missed the, the one that we should here, go to my website, see my Healthy Bones presentation. Yeah. So it's a complex issue, but one that I'm sure you'll understand after my talk. Yes? My gym is running this program, and they're basically telling people that whole grains are bad for you. Sure they are. And they're citing all these studies, and they're talking about the wheat belly book. What is a good response to that? Uh, people hear what they want to hear, and uh, there's not much of a response. Uh, uh, we have time for this. The, uh, <clears throat> Well, there's a story, um, and, and I think you know, here, give me an extra minute or two. There used to be a, a national television show um, called The Mythbusters, and on this show, these two guys would uh, take in some urban legend about uh, James Bond or whatever, it was rejected from the car, they would actually do the experiment, calculate the physics of it, and, you know, is this nonsense, or is it, is it a myth, or is it real? Well, one week, the, the, what they were testing, was um, do magnetic fields repel sharks? And the idea was if they could build out a, a, a mesh a garment that had a big magnetic field, it would keep the sharks away. So they were going to test it in three phases. One, the, uh, 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 they had a big long tank, about 40 feet long, shallow, about four feet of water. They, uh, oh, and they had a little shark in there. They took the shark, they took a big industrial bar magnet, and they just they grabbed the shark behind the gill there and brought the bar magnet in there. Oh, the shark didn't seem to like that. Oh, he moved his head all about it. He didn't like that. Uh, the next uh, one, they, uh, they had this shallow tank, and halfway down, they had a, a row of magnets in the floor of the tank. And the little shark went, went halfway down, got to the point where the magnets were, turned around and came back. Oh, it didn't like that. Mm, very interesting. But what is the ultimate test? What do they really need to do? They build this 25-foot geodesic dome out of structural steel, seal it all up except for a big hole about four feet across. Um, uh, they take it, they put it on a boat, they take it out to the Farallon Islands off San Francisco with a big, great white sand, make them sharks swim. They packed that big hole full of, the whole dome full of herring and mackerel, and they lowered it down with cameras on it and, oh, and they put big magnets around the mouth of the opening. Big magnetic field there. Uh, and they put it down, you know, and about 40 feet down, and, and watched what would happen. Well, what do you think of that? It took about 90 seconds. And this 20-foot great white comes in like a freight train. Didn't slam up, just slams his head into the, into the hole there, just cleans out two-thirds of the mackerel and leaves. And then this 18-foot mako shark comes in and comes like a, like a semi-truck and cleans out the rest of the fish and it go. That's the only thing that mattered. Okay. You can do these demonstrations. Oh, this diet makes the LDL go down. This one uh, increases your CoQ10. When you follow people on for 20 years, who's still alive? Who's had strokes? Who's had heart attacks? Who survived on this diet? Don't tell me that they're the LDL and their small particle size. You can, they're just making the shark's head wiggle. And these were all just little signs. Interesting. But when it really matters, does this diet save your life or doesn't? Does it keep you from having a heart attack, stroke, or colon cancer or doesn't? These people have no data. Nobody's done this. It's all being experimented. It's all confabulated. Well, when something seems right to sell my book, eat right for my bank book. Um, and, and, um, so don't get seduced by these, by the claim, oh, this may be all the only one now, this may be, they're just making the sharks hit wiggle. I want to know who, who's still alive after 15, 20 years on this diet. I know who's alive, Dr. Esselstyn's diet. Uh, show me uh, the, the same reality with these uh, ketogenic paleo diets. We have one minute and one, one minute question. and one last one. We're, uh, yeah. one. Okay. Uh, yeah. uh, do you have any thoughts on whether a plant-based diet would be beneficial for people on the autistic spectrum? If what would be beneficial for what? Whether the plant-based diet would be <laughs> beneficial for people on the autistic spectrum? On the autistic mm -hmm. spectrum? Um, yes. When you look at the uh, microbes of your autistic kids, they have a completely different 
instead of microbes, a whole bunch of good microbes that aren't there and a whole bunch of pathogenic ones that are, that are there. Well, these microbes are not passive bystanders. They, their waste products are dopamine and norepinephrine and neurotransmitters, and they get absorbed into the bloodstream, they affect the vagus nerve, they, and these things affect the, kid, the child's neurochemistry. And I'm not saying that it's, a com it's not a complex issue, but I'm wondering, at least in some of these kids, because there's now studies showing you pull the, the gluten and the dairy out of these autistic kids' diet. Many of them do much better. Get them on a plant-based diet, they do better. Probiotics can help them. Antibiotics help. Not saying that that's what they need, but the very fact that, of course, antibiotics make these kids brighter and saner says that microbes are probably playing a real role here. And I wonder if you had a kid that was leaning this way on the autistic spectrum, and he was showing all sorts of obstreperous, uh, outrageous behavior, maybe in some households to, to pacify and shut him up. He was given a pack of Oreos and some sugar water and a package of Skittles, and this kid's been eating sugar for two years, and now he's full-blown autistic. Well, maybe, maybe, at least part of that may have been you know, coming from his gut from the food these kids have been eating. So would a whole food plant make sense? It couldn't, as my Swedish grandmother would say, it couldn't point. Uh, that's for sure. And there's, there's a good chance that, that it may have a very profound effect. And certainly we're doing, there, is, there are some good studies on it. Dr. Uh, Dr. Clapper will be back tomorrow, Saturday, uh, here in the, in the theater at 11.30. So in the spirit of time, thank you, everybody. Great, and have a good day.